welcome back everyone to the lunch so we'll start with the first session post lunch so i'm very happy to welcome nilesh so uh, nilesh is uh, are uh, going to give a talk on securing kubernetes best practices and effective strategies so he has over 8 years of industry experience and i think uh, we'll be really getting a lot of insights from him thank you thank you and uh, hi everyone so uh, i'm here to talk about securing kubernetes and uh, what are the effective strategies and best practices that you can do So I'm not from around here. I'm from Sri Lanka. So I flew yesterday, and uh, I also run a similar community called uh, Cloud Native Sri Lanka back in Sri Lanka. So let's look at the Kubernetes attack surface. Before I do this, I just want to raise of hands. Who runs Kubernetes? Like manage Kubernetes clusters? Show of hands. Right, that's a few of you, right? What do you use? OpenShift or Rancher, or just Kubeadia? Rancher. All right. Okay. So this is actually relevant to a lot of people. So the people who run in the cloud manage GKE, AKS, EKS, uh, they only have to, you know, manage their application vulnerabilities. But the people who run their own clusters the first entry vector is your control plane components you have the api server running you have the etcd api you know all of your control plane components are over there so you have to protect those the next one is the application vulnerabilities if somebody hacks into one of your containers they can execute a remote shell uh talk to your services do mess up your cluster quite badly then let's say your vms are on uh, a public network and connected over the internet or something like that uh so then kubelet api is another place that you have to take a look at and protect because that's the place where all the container uh, the docker daemon and you know everything that runs is managed by kubelet you can do quite a lot of damage if you get uh, kubelet access there's a lot of light coming from there uh then uh, finally accessing uh, your virtual machines if somebody hacks in uh, gains ssh access or something into your virtual machines they can again ping your services and uh, because the network is still there so they can do quite a lot of damage on that front as well okay so let's start with protecting your applications first because that uh, applies to everyone here and then let's look at uh, how to uh, manage the uh, cluster level components so the first thing when you are doing application uh, security is securing your ci cd pipeline there's a first thing that you got to do and in ci cd pipeline there are a few stages there's a source stage then there's build then there's test and then you deploy in a very high level and across all these stages you have auditing and monitoring then at build and test you have static security testing and across again all the stages you have vulnerability testing and then at you know deploy stage you have runtime security so at the source level i'll just talk about auditing and monitoring for a second because i don't have a slide on that at the source level it's basically you know developer best practices you know putting proper prs and doing all of that which enables you to do proper auditing and monitoring at build level and test level it's the way you run your static scanning and then log them and then create git issues if there are problems if you ignore issues the the whole process that you do and at deploy level basically the logs of your runtime security okay so static security testing the first one i'm going to talk about is image vulnerability scanning and i believe all of you know how images work images has a base layer so each image is built with layers on top of them so if at least one layer is you know compromise or has a vulnerability 
it would go on to the other layers, as you can see from the example. So by exploiting a vulnerable image that is running, you can do quite a lot of damage. You can do privilege escalation. Uh, you can get remote shell access. Information can be leaked. Like, for example, if you are, I've seen certain companies like bake credentials into the image rather than mount. So I've seen that quite a lot. I see some of you are smiling. Maybe you're doing that. But don't do it. So uh, uh, DDoS attacks and all of that, right? So yeah, so to avoid this, so basically to uh, avoid information leaks, basically scanning is not going to help you. It's a developer practice that you have to do. Don't bake uh, credentials into images. But other vulnerabilities, you can quite easily scan and fix using you know, tools like Clear, Trivi, Snyke, and a few others. And also, a rule of thumb is use smaller images like Alpine images to start with, or official images. They have the least set of vulnerabilities. And there are scenarios where you know, there are vulnerabilities which has not been fixed yet. So in my company, what we do is, in such cases, we create a gate issue, and then we ignore it, and we move forward, and then we fix it later if it's not critical. But it depends on the processes that you have and you know, the risk assessment and all of it that your particular uh, company has. Right, the next one is code vulnerability scanning. Basically, scan your entire uh, code. Like There are tools like Sonacube, et cetera, which does quality gates and uh, scans whether you have hard-coded passwords and stuff like that in it, uh, which would allow you to figure out whether there are any vulnerabilities in the packages that you have imported to your code and all of that and fix how to fix those. Again, this uh, goes with the security practices that your company has and the policies. So there are certain things you will obviously have to ignore and go forward. Uh, there are scenarios where you can't do it and you somehow have to fix it and then push it. Then finally, configuration scanning. So there are tools like Chekhov, CubeSec, Confest, uh, yeah, ConfTest, etc., which basically scans your configuration files, like the YAMLs that you import on Argo CD. It would test those. And against a bunch of policies or best practices, it would tell you, like, for example, let's say that you haven't set security context on your deployment. So it would tell you that you have to do this as a best practice, uh, et cetera. So they, they allow you to enforce security standards. And in your enterprise, you can have your own bunch of rules and apply them so that there are no surprises when you deploy YAMLs to the cluster. So uh, I, I thought I'd talk about Kubernetes admission controller here. So this is how it works. Like if you are using uh, something like open policy agent, which your com uh, you can say like you can only run pods with a certain, uh, run images of a certain registry and nothing else. What you can do is uh, admission controller has two webhooks, one called validating webhook and another one called mutating webhook. Uh, what the mutating webhook do is, according to a given logic and a bunch of annotations, you can actually change the content of the YAML before it gets applied and executed. Whereas the validating webhook, uh, all it does is it scans your YAML and then makes a decision whether it should go forward and get applied or you know get denied, right? And then. These plug into third-party policy controllers like the open policy agent. Um, yeah, so that's how Kubernetes admission controller works. And if you do employ something like open policy agent, this is how it would look like once you enforce certain rules on Kubernetes uh, configurations. The next one is container hardening. How do you harden your containers? Uh, pretty basic stuff. Uh, removing bash and shell is one of the best ways you can stop people from you know, executing into your container and you know, doing stuff. 
uh, if, you, if you look at Kubernetes API server and all of it, you can't really uh, SSH into them because they have removed bash and uh, shell. Then the next one is making your root file system read-only. Uh, we make sure that your application is, you know, your container is stateless. And also, no intruder can come and write things into your file system. And let's say that you're running something like Nginx or something that actually do write certain parts uh, into your application. Then you use empty DIRs. Then you mount it into your certain parts, and then it allows you to do writes. But the base container image um, at the file system, you cannot. Then finally, run as a non-root user. So certain images, they do need privileged uh, users. Like, for example, if you're running Falco, uh, you need uh, a root user. But other than that, you know, normal applications, like your Java app, your Python app, etc., which are non-system apps, uh, make sure to run them as non-root, so that even if somebody SSHs in and or attacks your container, they will be restricted within that, will not go into uh, the, run, uh, the VM level. Then let's say that the image is already built. You don't have control over the image. All you can have is the control of running it. Then there are a few things you can do as well. You can use a startup probe and execute a shell command to remove bash of your container. That's quite easy to do. Uh, then there are in security context policies, you can set as run as group, run as user, and run as run, non root to set things up. And also, as I mentioned earlier, enforce these rules using a open policy agent. So that's how those are the strategies you have for container hardening. Container runtime security. This is where when we do all our scans and everything is fine, but at runtime, there are some malicious code that is running. And uh, we don't know, like maybe a Bitcoin mining or something like that. We haven't captured at runtime level, uh, the static scanning level. So a uh, little intro on how our containers work. As you can see, physical hardware runs below. And then we have the Linux kernel. And then we have uh, the Linux container LXE running. It is like the virtualization. Uh, and then you have containers running. So basically, if one cont all of these containers are now talking through syscalls to your kernel of the VM to execute processors and commands. So if there's a vulnerability in your kernel, the containers actually can exploit it and then attack other containers in your VM. So in a single tenanted scenario, this is not a big case. Uh, but if, you are, if your cluster is, let's say, multi-tenanted, like you have outsourced, outsourced certain namespaces to third party software vendors or whoever that's you know, building in your infrastructure, this could be a problem. That's where you know, uh, container sandboxing comes into play. By using container sandboxing like Gvisor, uh, Kata containers, etc., they would isolate your container processors in such a way that they cannot be exploited and uh, attack other. Uh, your kernels cannot be exploited using those. If container sandboxing is not an option, the other option you have is using other app armor or seccomp profiles. Using either app armor or seccomp profiles, what you can do is you can actually restrict processes or syscalls happening in your kernel. And then you can actually say, these are the syscalls that are allowed. And uh, you know anything other than that is not allowed. So there are standard. Uh, default seccomp and uh, app armor profiles available. So you can use those to run your normal applications. And then there are other tools that continuously monitor what happens in your runtime processes. One tool is called Sysdig Falco, which is open source. By utilizing that, you can quite easily, uh, it has a default rule set as well. So if somebody has executed a remote shell, or if someone is writing into the file system, it automatically gives an alert, and you can act accordingly. 
So these are the strategies for you to uh, manage container runtime security. This is a general rule of thumb, basically. Don't use environment variables. Uh, always mount them as files. Uh, and then if you are managing secrets, it's recommended to use an external vault like HashiCorp vault or in the clouds they already have um, secret managers available. And uh, as a developer discipline, do not log uh, sensitive information. I've been with certain organizations that there have been PII issues and other issues where they have logged uh, tokens and etc. when an error has been thrown. So yeah, that's a developer discipline that you have to do. So that's it. And then this is for if you're running multiple tenants on your Kubernetes cluster, isolating your network. One is namespaces, but I think a previous speaker already spoke that namespaces is a very weak isolation, so you have to harden it. So one way of hardening is using network policies. By using network policies, you can quite easily say, this namespace, the containers in this namespace cannot talk to the containers in the other namespace. It's sort of like a firewall. Um, and then even the, if you have API gateways, you can actually make sure even the uh, internal services can go through the API gateway with authentication. But if not, then there's nothing much you can do. Or use MTLS with uh, a service measures, or I think Cilium now has MTLS with uh, eBPF. But here's the thing, just because, because you install Linkerd or Istio and enabled automatic MTLS doesn't mean you are secure. It basically identifies who's talking to who. That's it. You have to attach network policies too so that you can govern and say only this can talk to this one. MTLS would just encrypt your uh, network traffic, which is good, but you need the whole solution. Um, that is it on isolating your tenants in the network. So here's a small example of how network policies work. Uh, as you can see, there's an ingress all uh, allow policy for the simple app namespace. And the requests do come to web server. And within it, we have added network policies so that web server cannot talk to database. And web server can only talk to the Python backend. And Python backend can talk to the database. So because web server is the public exposed one, if somebody hacks into web server and gains shell access through to the web server, they can only attack Python backend. They cannot directly attack the database. So that is how you do security. Right. So the next one is protecting your control plane. I think I'm about time also. Uh, Right, so hardening your Kubernetes cluster. So I heard some people from some people that they have created clusters using Rancher. Uh, I think by default, Rancher do enable audit logging. But just to make sure, I think the default way they do it, they don't mount the audit policies and then mount, mount the logs back into your VM so that you can uh, take a look later. So that's very important. So when you enable audit logging via RKE or something else. Uh, you have to make sure you give a path uh, to log the audit. And also, not just the path is enough. You have to mount a host path. Into, like you, have to give, uh, you have to basically provide a path on the host and mount it to the API server so that it's actually retained even if the API server dies and restarts the logs are retained on your, your master node. So that's very important because I've seen a lot of enterprises when I ask them, oh, I have audit logs enabled. So can I see that? And then when you SSH into the VM, there's no audit logs that you can see. So they have actually enabled the audit logs, but they're actually writing within the API server container, not in the VM. So you had to mount the volume, a host path volume, so that you can retain it. Uh, 
The other one is use CIS hardened node images. Uh, I think if you're running uh, even Azure or Google, and if you're running your own clusters rather than managed services, they have in their marketplace CIS hardened images. Use those to spin up your nodes. And even on premises, I think there are CIS hardened uh, Ubuntu and you know whatever available, so you can use those. And then another one is encrypting etcd. I don't think Rancher by default encrypts etcd, I'm not sure. Uh, but it's a good practice for you to encrypt your etcd as well. Like if somebody hacks into your VMs, like let's say an ex-employee or like somebody from Mission Impossible comes into your uh, <laughs> enterprise, right? Uh, you hack into your VM, but you look at the etcd, it's encrypted. But yeah, of course, if it's Mission Impossible, they decrypt it. But in the real world, I think they'll find it hard. Uh, so yeah. And uh, I already mentioned this. Mount your secrets as files and not as environment variables. Because if it is environment variables, what happens is if somebody hacks into your VM, they are able to actually uh, list the environment variables via the process. There's a way you can do it. Uh, but if it is files, then actually you can't uh, do that. So that's why it's recommended for you to uh, mount your secret as files. And also don't keep the Kubernetes uh, secrets. Just use something else like uh, HashiCorp Key Vault or something else. Or, or even Bitnami secrets is fine. So yeah. Uh, I'll just do a quick round off on Kubernetes RBAC. I think there's another talk coming later on OIDC and how to connect with Kubernetes. So just the basics. In Kubernetes, there's nobody, like, doesn't have a concept called users. So users are managed externally. So Kubernetes don't have a resource called users. It's a matter, matter of, you know, where we create a, a key, key pair and then we authorize it with the CA of the cluster, sign it off, and then that person who has the key pair can actually uh, access the cluster. Kubernetes has a concept of service accounts in which using the service accounts, you can provide some roles and et cetera, and which can be mounted into your containers, and then you can use Kubernetes API. So when it comes to permissions, uh, we have roles and role binding, and then we have cluster roles and cluster role bindings. As the name suggests, role is binded with a namespace. So if you have a certain role like read secrets, it's only available in that namespace. And when you do a role binding for a user or a service account, they can only execute that only in that namespace. Whereas cluster role is cluster level, and uh, if, let's say, me, Nilesh, I have the cluster, uh, uh, the cluster role of reading secrets, uh, if I do a cluster role binding to me, then I can actually read uh, secrets of all namespaces. But if I do a role binding with a namespace attached, I can only read from that namespace. So there's no way in Kubernetes you can do like, Nilesh can only read these, these, these namespaces. There's no way. If, if you want to do something like that, you have to do role bindings per namespace. That's how you do it. And this is an example. I just gave an example too, so just quickly go through. Uh, John has a role binding. So there are two secret roles, read secret role and read write secret cluster role. And then on full namespace, John has the read secret role bind into John, so he can actually read secrets in the full namespace. But if you look at Jane and admin, Jane is connected to the cluster role with a namespace bound role binding. And admin has a cluster role binding to the cluster role. So as you can see with the red markers, that admin can actually read all the namespaces, whereas Jane can only read and write into the full namespace. So that's it. All right, so we are at the end of my presentation. So final thoughts is, you know, Kubernetes is, it's not new now, 
but for a lot of security engineers and etc it's still new they are figuring it out and there are vulnerabilities exploited every day and if you are running cloud managed kubernetes you know you only have to worry about your application security everything else is managed by the cloud control plane and if you do run with you know proper best practices and proper developer self discipline you should be all right so that's the end of my presentation thank you so much any questions right at what level should we use psp or no what are you thinking so uh, her question was uh, i think port security policies versus open policy agent as far as i know with kubernetes 1.23 or 22 onwards port security policies were deprecated and they are also uh, enabling you to work dynamically with oh, something like open policy agent uh, to have some set of rules and then go through that. Because I believe pod security policies were a bit limited on scope. That's why they deprecated it. So now the Kubernetes community, Kubernetes is also recommending you to use something like OPA to have set of rules and then use their gatekeeper to enforce those uh, with, with the webhooks that I explained in the slide. All right. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Three nodes, uh, master nodes, and three will be there. The, the synchronization between the replications and the rapid request comes load will be very high. So, okay. So in that cases, when we do for each request in their encryption mode, so will it uh, reduce the uh, increase the load uh, performance in the grid? So how we can uh, in, uh, increase the entry mode if the performance is very important to the grid? Right. So interesting question. Uh, so his question was, uh, when you have multiple HCD nodes and when you en enable encryption, uh, and then if you have a lot of load coming in and if performance is you know, your core requirement, how do you do it, like whether there's a problem? So I personally, like there are limits in HCD as far as I know as well. And of course, encryption and decryption would give you a performance, a slight performance bump. Uh, uh, one as well. So I actually managed the Sri Lankan government election Kubernetes clusters. Uh, so we did encounter that as well because on election nights there are a lot of requests coming in and polling and all of it. So, uh, but here's the thing. It's a trade-off. Either it's performance or security. In the government scenario, it was security for us. So the performance bump uh, issue was a trade-off that we had to endure. So there are sometimes there are, there's, those are trade-offs. There's no magic solution for stuff like that. Hey, one more question. Here. Uh, so so uh, these security things, right? So uh, let's say the read-only and all these things, even if I said, how can I monitor that all my nodes, right? Let's say if I'm running a big cluster or multiple clusters, how can I monitor? Are there any tools from which we can see what are the open security issues that are right? Because let's say part of the teams are implemented and some don't, right? How can I manage that? Yeah, so this is where the build versus buy thing comes into play. So there are tools that actually allow you to do that, but you've got to pay for them. One, one thing is, I don't know whether I, I, I think I can talk about SysDig, right? It's a CNCF one. So SysDig mm -hmm. is one of such uh, tools, then there are other new act and few others as well that does it for you. Um, but if you were to do it yourselves using only open source, then you probably need to have a good platform engineering team with uh, CubeSec, uh, sorry, um, Falco setup, open policy agent setup, and do continuous scanning. Because let's say I scanned my image today and it passed and it's now running on the cluster, and then you haven't done a deployment for about a week or a month. They have a lot of, remember the log4j incident? Log4j was an exploitation that has been existed for a while in Java. So you have to continuously run static scans as well against your stuff. Yeah. But, but SysDig, it will automatically do the live monitoring? So Sorry. Can we, in SysDig, yeah. can we see a live monitoring? Will it automatically keep looking for that it continuously? Does. As far as I know, it does. Okay. So don't take my word for it, check it out. But as far as I know, they do. Got it. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you.
All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you so much.